The Will to Believe by William James. It's probably easiest to situate The Will to Believe by William James. It's probably easiest to understand what William James is doing in his The Will to Believe by sort of understanding what problem he was addressing. And for James, the problem was how we can justify our belief in certain claims that we don't have good evidence for believing. So is it okay sometimes to believe in something, and he's thinking in terms of moral and sort of religious sort of ideas, without having good evidence? So if you and I are sitting in a windowless room, and I say to you, it's raining outside, and you can't see outside or hear anything from outside, then it would be sort of foolish for you to believe that without any further evidence. So I can't just tell you something and have you believe it without some sort of proof or evidence. And so this is true, in fact, of, of moral and religious claims that we oftentimes don't have evidence for those. So there might be some sort of personal experience that you might, for, for one reason or another, you might believe something. But that really doesn't count as a reason that everyone or anyone else might have for believing in that thing. So what James is really concerned about is, can I legitimately say I have a belief and that I'm sort of justified in holding that belief without adequate evidence? And he's talking again, as I said, moral questions. So first he wants to look at, well, what's the nature of belief itself? So for him, he starts out with this idea of a hypothesis. So if I have a hypothesis like God exists, it's anything proposed for our belief. So a hypothesis is just something, is sort of an idea that's been presented to us for the possibility of belief. So it's proposed to our belief, as he says. So when I offer a hypothesis that um, God exists, the question is, is there any way that I can sort of justify answering yes to that sort of belief? Now, he thinks that certain beliefs, certain hypotheses, hypotheses, have um, certain character, different characteristics. So for something to be a truly something that we could possibly believe in, that could be a real hypothesis for us, something that would really, that really we can consider for belief, it has to be a live or real possibility. So on this account, he thinks that only certain things presented to certain individuals have the chance of being believed. So if I'm raised in a Western society in which it's, you know, Christianity is the sort of main religion, that might be a real possibility for me. On the other hand, if somebody said, well, you know what, you should really look into the Shinto religion, or maybe for some even Buddhism would still be such a foreign idea that relative to any given individual, that might not be a real option. So one says, well, you can choose what it is you want to believe, and of all the religions in the world, you could pick one that you want. But are some religions really a live option to us is sort of an open question. James says that, no, some individuals are, of course, are not going to view some options as real. So it's much different from saying, well, I was raised, say, Catholic, and now I'm a Methodist or Lutheran. The jump is not that big. Those are real options. They're similar sorts of backgrounds. So it's easy to see how someone might go from one you know, sect of Christianity to another, as opposed to is a real option for me to become a Zoroastrian or something like that. What it also means um, to, to be a live option is that there's a willingness on the part of the person who's believing to act irrevocably. And what that means is that I'm willing to actually act on that belief in some substantial way. So if it was in the case of James, where he's specifically really considering moral and religious belief, am I willing to sort of put myself out there on religious grounds and say, I'm going to restructure the way I live my life, say? I'm going to, there are certain things I'm going to do or not do because of what my religion tells me. And that's what it means to, to really a willingness to act irrevocably. It's not just to say, I believe that and then change nothing about my actions or my way of life. But this means that if I truly find this a live option, that I am willing to act on that option in some way that's irrevocable. Now, oftentimes I might have an option between two hypotheses. So um, he wants to look at how it is I would come down on one side or the other for a particular hy hypothesis. So between two hypotheses, there's some hypotheses that are living and some that are dead. Those are just some that are really, and again, dead to us or living to us, right? Whether or not they're going to appeal to us or not. Um, some are forced versus some are avoidable, All right, So a forced option is one that I have to make a decision. I can't remain neutral 
with regard to my decision, where others are avoidable. So if I have to make a decision, a belief about something, some, um, and James would take sort of religious belief for many, would be a forced sort of decision, right? I can't just not believe. I can't just avoid, I should say, believing because that has implications, right? It's sort of the idea of by not acting, you've acted, right? That's a form of a forced option. So if um, there's a, a famous example in ethics, a trolley problem where the question is, um, do you pull a switch and allow this trolley full of people to veer off and um, kill some other guys on a track? Or do you leave the switch where it is and allow the, the trolley to continue on and go over a cliff? And you say, well, it's not my decision to make. I'm, I'm choosing, choosing not to act. And the truth is, well, of course, by not acting, you're actually acting, right? So the trolley is going to go one. Either it's going to kill four people or it's going to kill the 20 people on the trolley. By not acting, you're in essence acting. So it's a forced sort of, sort of choice for you. And it's got to be momentous versus trivial. So some hypotheses are momentous. They have a substantial impact on us where others are trivial. For example, it might be the case that I have to decide between, you know, two hypotheses or two, um, let, let me give a more mundane example, where I'm going to go to eat, right? Whether I eat at one restaurant or another is not a momentous decision. It's a very trivial sort of decision. Whether I'm going to actually, you know, sort of revise the way I live my entire life, that's a pretty momentous sort of thing. So all of these, when deciding between hypotheses, we can sort of categorize them as living versus dead, ones that are truly live and, and real to us versus ones that are really not live or a real option to us, ones that we can't avoid, that are forced, and that are momentous, that are important sort of decisions. Now, these are going to be, this is going to be sort of the foundation for um, how James is going to justify ultimately making decisions in which we lack enough evidence to make a fully rational decision. So a fully rational decision is one where there's um, sort of tons of knockdown reasons for one position over another, right? I have good reason for believing. So on that same example I gave earlier, if we're sitting in my office and I'm sitting by the window and you can't see out the window and I look and say, it's raining outside. Well, you get up, you look out the window, you see the water on the glass, you can see the rain coming. I say, oh, I've got really good reason for believing what you've just told me. And in those cases, there's no real debate, right? That's, a, that's an easy situation. It's in those cases where we don't have enough evidence. Can I still make a belief statement or can I still embrace some idea and he's going to argue that it's the living forced and momentous situations that allow us to go beyond um, just looking for reasons so there are times when we sort of take that sort of leap in belief so it's a genuine option genuine options are living options forced options and momentous as I've just said these are what he means by a genuine option so when confronted with a genuine option the question is when is it okay for me to believe without adequate information? Now, James says that, the, that there are certain psychological factors or considerations when dealing with different kinds of facts. And this is, um, this is what allows him to sort of make the argument that we don't need this sort of 100% certainty. So around the time James is writing, there are other writers who say, you know, look, you should not believe anything that you're not sort of completely justified in believing. And this is what James wants to counter. And in part, his counter is a psychological sort of counter. So the one type of facts, he says, are intellectual facts. He says, no amount of willing can change. So there is a case in which we say, of the different types of facts in the world, things that we believe in, um, the example here, Barack Obama was president, Donald Trump is president. It doesn't matter how much you may or may not like who's president. You can't will who was president into not being who was the president, and you can't will who is president into becoming the president, right? These are independent in that sense of our will, of what we, of what we will to believe. So notice the topic of this is what I've decided to believe or will to believe as, as a fact. So intellectual facts are one type of fact, and he says, our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. So he's going to say right off the bat that if there's an answer, if there are the types of facts, intellectual facts, where I can give you sort of an empirical judgment, then that's not something that's up for debate. You can't just will those things to be a belief. I choose not to believe that the sun rises in the east or something like that. 
that's fine. You can hold that belief, but it's not an actual justified belief. And so James wants to take off the table any sort of belief that we have that can be decided on those sort of intellectual or empirical grounds, right? So he's not saying that you can just go around believing whatever you want. Well, if it's live and it's momentous and the whole thing, and I just decide I'm going to believe. Well, no, that's, that's not enough. You want to believe the earth is flat, that's fine, but there's good evidence against that. There's facts of the matter that no matter how much you will that to be the case, you can't make that be a sort of fact. Now, there are sort of obligations we have. So this, again, we're going back to the psychological. What are their, our duties in matters of opinion? Well, when we're talking about belief states, he's saying that we must know the truth, right? So the idea is that we want to know the truth. We're trying to avoid error. And in James's account, that what oftentimes the reason why we get sort of hung up on the sort of quest for intellectual facts, right? I want to be able to answer all these questions. Is there a God? So we look at the um, the proofs for God's existence. Is there a God? I want a knockdown, drag out, 100% reason. I want the truth, and I don't want to be in error. I don't want to make a mistake about this. This is too important for me to make a, stake, a mistake about. And so oftentimes our desire, if we're sort of um, good philosophers, good philosophy students, good rational individuals, we want to know truth and avoid error. And what James argues in the article is, you know, there are worse things than being duped, right? Than being mistaken about something or being thought or made to believe something that isn't the case. And sometimes in order to get to the truth, we have to take the chance of being wrong. We have to make the, the we have it takes the chance of possibly being in error about what it is we believe. So he agrees, of course, that we want to know truth and we want to avoid error. But if our desire to avoid error is so strict that we never make in, in very, now he's going to say it's very specific sort of situations, we never make these sort of jumps um, and take a chance, um, we may actually lose out on the truth by being so, so structured in this way. So there can be cases where our passions can inevitably and lawfully determine our choices. So in other words, when we say passions, we're saying our feelings, our intuitions, things that are not rational, there may be cases when it's okay, even though there's a possibility that we're in error, that we could be making a mistake or be duped into making a mistake, it still might be okay. So we can, in many situations, avoid choosing and, and avoid error, so that's always an option. Um, but objective nature, our objective nature, rarely puts us in jeopardy of being duped. In other words, usually in a case where we're presented with some hypothesis, and the question is whether we ought to believe or not believe. And if it meets those qualifications, right, if it's something that's a living option to us, it's a real option, it's um, a momentous sort of thing, and it's unavoidable, then um, once we use our objective reasoning, our objective nature, and we look at all the evidence and then, well, there doesn't seem to be evidence against it. There doesn't seem to be evidence that says I shouldn't believe it. So I've taken care of that objective part. It's truly a decision that I have to make, again, by all those characteristics, right? It's living, it's unavoidable, and it's momentous. Then it's in those cases where he said, maybe going on our gut, going by our passions, as he would put it, might then lawfully determine. In other words, it's okay then to make that. And in part, it's okay to make that leap. Someone like a Kierkegaard may say like a leap of faith because there's a, there's a possibility or potential for actually gaining some truth or knowledge by doing it. In other words, we have to make that sort of jump in order to get the benefits of the belief. And the only way we can do that is to sort of put our reason aside, say, well, there's no evidence against, I can't settle this in, in terms of objective facts, but I have to make this sort of leap of faith. So moral questions are questions like this. And James would put in there, would put in, in this also religious sort of questions, right? Um, moral questions can't really wait upon sensible proof. In other words, we can't wait to have a 100% knockdown, drag out, yes, this is the absolute truth in morality, right? If we did, we could never make certain... Um, moral pronouncements, right? We, we, we want to say that certain things are definitely wrong, even if I can't give you some sort of foundational account of why it's wrong, right? So I want to say the Holocaust was wrong, right? I want to say Nazis are bad. I want to say that harming people gratuitously just because I enjoy it is something that's wrong, right? So I don't want to have to say, well, I have to, you know, sort of 
reserve judgment until somebody can prove to me what morality is or what ethics are 100%. So, of course, we have ethical principles and ideas. But the question is whether you can actually justify all those principles in a way that is beyond refutation, right? Where no one can say, oh, yes, I, I believe this is the right way to approach ethics. I'm a utilitarian or a Kantian, and there's no objection to my position. Well, if we waited for that, we would never be able to make any sort of moral pronouncement. So James says that can't be the case. With moral questions, they're just too pressing. There are too many things that we have to decide on. So he says science can tell us what is the case, but it can't tell us what ought to be the case. So this is why, again, moral questions are not settled by um, appeal to empirical information, right? When I ask what kind of world do you want to live in, that's not the same thing as what kind of world is there. So you may say to me, ah, people treat each other really badly, and oh, people aren't that generous, or people don't care about other people that much, or some people, yeah, there are some people that are really poor and some people that are very rich, and yeah, everything you're telling me is what is the case. But to make a pronouncement like, yes, but it ought to be different, is to make a moral claim. And that's not something I can settle, that when I say, this is how society ought to be. I can't settle that sort of discussion or argument with facts. It comes down to something else. So there are some cases where a preliminary faith must exist before a fact can come to be or be known. So for example, the government, army, college, in other words, you have to, in those cases, so giving, taking some of those examples, you have to have sort of a, take a leap that this is going to be good before you actually get to that good, right? So we have to all agree for government, for example, um, when forming a government, I give up certain rights that I would normally have, say, in a state of nature. So if there's no government and no laws and, and no um, policing activity, then it turns out that it's sort of a war of all against all, right? Any of us could do what anyone else uh, to anyone else what we want to do because there is no one to enforce laws. Now, what do I have to do? In order to form a government, the people have to stand back and say, okay, I'm willing sort of on faith to not harm you if you agree not to harm me. And in fact... I'm also willing to take a chance to say, look, I will refrain from doing these things and give power to a central authority to make my life better off. But notice there's a leap of faith there. I have no evidence that everyone else is going to do the same. You know, in other words, I suspect they will. They're going to say they will. But I'm taking a leap. I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to actually keep their word, that they're going to follow through, and that once that government's formed, it's going to do what it was designed to do in a way that I don't find objectionable or harmful. So in many ways, anything that we, we form, when we form these sort of associations, these are not empirical questions. These are not empirical beliefs that I can just say, oh, yes, of course, when people get together, they always do the right thing. So that means I have to take a leap of faith. And the only way that I can sort of get to the facts or get to the good is by sort of going beyond what the evidence presents to me. And James says, that's okay. He says, those instances are pressing enough. They're unavoidable, they're momentous and living that it's okay if we don't have the reasons necessary or the reasons that we would normally think necessary to sort of justify our position. So he says, in truth dependent on our personal action, then faith based on desire is certainly a lawful and possibly an indispensable thing. So when it requires, when there's a decision that's required to be made that can't be made based on intellectual facts, there might be times when a faith-based sort of jump may be completely justifiable. So the religious hypothesis, we notice that this is a moral hypothesis we've been talking about, but the religious hypothesis is the same, right? Religion is a momentous option. Religious is forced in terms of its benefits, right? I can't just abstain from believing. I can't avoid it because if I at least in certain instances, depending on which religion we're talking about, there are certain things that I'm required to do in order to get the rewards or the benefits of that religion. And um, assuming that it's a live option, which will depend on the person, of course, if this is the case, then a religious hypothesis is one that may require me to take this sort of leap. So for James, for example, religious belief, if you're struggling with religious belief, say, um, and you're saying, well, look, I have no good evidence in fact, I might even have evidence that counts against the existence of an all-good God or something like that. So we've, you know, if you discuss the problem of evil and you find that, well, some of those argu arguments seemed a little compelling, and at the same time, I feel some, some sort of forced 
on this, right? This option to me is one that's a living option. It seems forced to me. I, I think there's a one way of life might be better than another to live. And there's certain benefits I get. And for James, he's actually, James is sort of um, famous for at least the way James has been interpreted for saying that, you know, the to have faith might be okay if it benefits you, right? So for one individual, it might not be. I might say, ah, I don't need faith. I don't really desire the comfort of faith. It doesn't do anything for me. It's not really a live option for me. I don't find it compelling or forced in any way. So I, d I choose not to believe. Where James might say, look, if, if belief in a divine being helps you get through the day, if it comforts you when you're having hard times, if, if it at the end of your life, if it gives you some, so, some sort of solace or comfort, then by all means believe because you're justified. There's no way we can settle this sort of claim on intellectual grounds. And so it might actually be that what you end up with is a much better way of life by taking that leap, by going beyond what the intellectual facts may justify. Um, there's not, you know, there is a possibility, of course, that you're wrong, right? You might structure your life in a way that you didn't have to. You may refrain from doing some things you would have otherwise done, but your religion told you not to. But James says, if that gives you comfort, then you can sort of reasonably, justifiably um, believe in that thing without proper evidence. Now, it also should tell us that, you know, in many, in many instances, when it comes to certain moral, our moral claims that we make or moral positions we take or religious positions we take, that it might sort of induce in us a little bit of humility to recognize that what I'm believing in whether it's a moral claim or a religious sort of claim or religious hypothesis or a moral hypothesis, when I'm believing those things, that in fact I am going beyond what I can sort of rationally, at least 100% rationally justify, right? The most I might be able to do is say there are good reasons for this, but they're not 100%. And at some point, in fact, the reasons don't give me 100, uh, sort of 100% full claim to make this belief where I would require that in other cases, right? Where I would say, no, 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 I need more evidence for that. In these particular areas, in religious sort of areas and moral areas, James is saying there's good grounds, there's good reasons for accepting decisions that aren't based on good reasons, or at least aren't based on enough reasons that we would normally require in other areas.